Good afternoon. My name is Deb Arns, and I am the Senior Museum Curator here at the Nebraska State Historical Society, and I'd like to welcome you all to our July 2004 Brown Bag Lecture Series program. I'd like to mention before introducing our speaker today that the taping for this series is provided by the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation. And I'd also like to mention that today's presentation is part of the Be a Tourist in Your Own Hometown <coughs> Um, promotion here in Lincoln. Uh, this is a, a promotion that encourages people to visit the various museums and cultural attractions in Lincoln and you can pick up a passport and get stamped at each location and then um, be eligible for prizes at the July 3rd, no September 3rd Salt Dogs game. So um, welcome. Today's presentation and today's presenter is Jim Potter. Jim has been working for the Nebraska State Historical Society for about 37 years and he has been archivist, senior editor of the Nebraska History Magazine and currently he is our senior research historian. And today Jim's presentation is Paper Towns, Wildcat Banks, and Carpetbag Governors, Territorial Nebraska in the 1850s. So if you would please give a warm welcome to Jim Potter. Thank you very much, Deb, for that generous introduction. <laughs> As you all know, this year marks the 150th anniversary of the act that created the territories of Nebraska and Kansas. In popular terminology, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. When it was signed into law by President Franklin Pierce on May 30th, 1854, the act established Nebraska as a political entity and initiated its nearly 13-year experience as a U.S. territory. I suspect, however, that the annual observance of Statehood Day has fixed March 1st, 1867 in many Nebraskans' minds as the genesis date in our history. What happened here between 1854 and 1867 should not be overlooked because the territorial years molded and refined the state of Nebraska to be, along with her leaders, people, economy, politics, and institutions. What's more, the history of those years is fascinating, filled with intriguing personalities, carpetbag politics, volatile journalism, and financial chicanery. Historian Roy Nichols termed the territorial system, quote, one of the most inspired inventions of the American political genius. End quote. After the American Revolution, Congress was faced with how to secure and develop new lands to the west of the original colonies. The plan Congress came up with under the Ordinance of 1787 provided the basic methodology for creating new states in the Federal Union, first by organizing them as territories. During the territorial period, despite ostensible control from Washington, the people would learn to govern themselves in what was essentially a grassroots operation. And once the necessary population had been achieved and the basic institutions of self-government were in place, the people of a territory could draft a constitution and apply for statehood. 31 of the 50 states were once territories. And during most of our history, the process of transforming politically unorganized lands into territories and then into states went smoothly, at least by comparison with Nebraska and Kansas. By 1854, a series of complex moral, economic, social, and political factors on the national scene divided the nation over how or even if these territories should be organized. The most, cont most contentious issue was whether slavery would be allowed in the lands west of the Missouri River. Because the outcome of this decision threatened to upset the tenuous balance of power between North and South. According to Professor Nichols, the conflict that ensued over the organization of Nebraska and Kansas was, quote, the most spectacular act in the drama of territorial history. I'm not here today to discuss the political history of the Kansas Nebraska Act, which is a fascinating story in its own right. For that, there are many sources, including an article by Ross Drake 
in the May 2004 issue of Smithsonian entitled The Law That Ripped America in Two. Instead today I want to review briefly how the territorial system worked during Nebraska's early years. Bear in mind that Nebraska's territorial history was very different from that of her sister to the south. Bleeding Kansas, as it came to be known, was racked by violence between free soil and pro-slavery forces seeking control of the territorial government and thus the right, under the doctrine of popular sovereignty, to determine whether Kansas would be slave or free. Such intense political turmoil and outright guerrilla warfare had no counterpart here. The basic framework of territorial organization provided for the administration in Washington to appoint a governor, secretary, marshal, and Supreme Court judges and pay their salaries and those of the legislature, which was elected by the people. The people also elected a non-voting delegate to Congress, but they could not vote for president. Under the patronage system, the appointed officials were from the party in power and during the early years of Nebraska Territory, all of them were Democrats. In fact, Nebraska did not have a two-party system or formal party organizations until the late 1850s, when hostility to democratic policies both nationally and in the territory sparked the rise of the new Republican Party, which was dedicated to the abolition of slavery. Because true political partisanship was lacking during the first years of Nebraska Territory, most issues involve sectionalism and personality, heavily tinged with the quest for power and money. Among other issues, Nebraskans contended over the location of the territorial capital, for the seats in the legislature, and for territorial delegate. Individuals and special interest groups often sought to use the mechanisms of government to help them profit through speculation in real estate, the granting of special charters for ferries and colleges, and the creation of cities, many of which existed only on paper. These features of territorial politics also underpinned the economy. Only later did agriculture, overland freighting, and other more dependable pursuits replace political self-aggrandizement and speculation as the basis for Nebraska development. In 1854, white settlement became legal in the New Nebraska Territory, which as you can see from the map was a vast region. It became legal virtually overnight. Everyone who came here was an outsider, including the politicians the president chose for leadership positions. These appointments were often a reward for past political service or were made to cushion a party loyalist from the effects of a recent political setback. Most appointees saw them as opportunities to advance their political careers or enhance their economic status. The first governor of Nebraska Territory was a South Carolina Democrat named Francis Burt, a former newspaper man and lawyer, lawyer who had served in President Pierce's administration. He went to bed at Bellevue immediately upon his arrival in Nebraska and died two days after taking the oath of office. The arduous trip from South Carolina had literally killed him. Some thought he had planned to name Bellevue as the territorial capital. Burt's death opened the doors for another carpetbagger to make momentous decisions about Nebraska's future. He was Thomas B. Cumming, the 25-year-old territorial secretary who hailed from Iowa and who was in league with Council Bluff speculators poised to profit from the opening of Nebraska Territory. They particularly favored development directly across the Missouri River at the fledgling settlement of Omaha City, which had been laid out by the Omaha and Council Bluffs Ferry Company, of which Cumming was a member. As one of his first official acts, Cumming called the territorial legislature to meet at Omaha City to the outrage of Bellevue residents who realized the territorial capital was likely to end up wherever the legislature was first gaveled into session. Moreover, coming ordered a census, and disregarding that more Nebraskans live south of the Platte River than north of it, apportioned the legislative districts to favor the North Platte section, 
Another way to ensure that the first legislature would, likely, would be likely to fix the Capitol at Omaha, which it did at its first session early in 1855. These decisions sparked a full-blown sectional rivalry that would be the leading feature of territorial politics for the rest of the decade, with the great prize of the Capitol and perhaps the terminus of the future Transcontinental Railroad hanging in the balance. Contentious wrangling about relocating the capital somewhere, anywhere but Omaha, marked each of the first four sessions of the territorial legislature. According to an early Nebraska history, quote, every other act of the legislature was subordinate and subsidiary to this one measure and motive of creating something for a commonwealth composed mostly of speculators and carpetbaggers, end quote. Close on the heels of territorial organization came the establishment of newspapers, primarily mouthpieces for the rival towns and sections, and regularly used to blast political or sectional adversaries in the most vituperative language. Since the South Platte section had lost the capital to Omaha, at least temporarily, its papers, such as the Nebraska Palladium at Bellevue and the Nebraska City News, continually hurled verbal bombshells against North Platte politicians and the newspapers that supported them. After the first legislature had voted Omaha as the territorial capital, the Palladium charged that the decision had been made, quote, against the wish of the great majority of the people, located for the pecuniary and personal benefit of Tom Cumming and his brother Bribers, located at a place without any natural advantages and one totally barren of anything save whiskey shops and drunken politicians." End quote. One of the most prolific, prolific writers on the political scene was the useful J. Sterling Morton, only 23 when he came to Nebraska, and whose pen could skewer an opponent with exquisite sarcasm. For a time, Morton edited the Nebraska City paper and also wrote numerous resolutions, newspaper articles, and tracts calculated to keep the political pot boiling. One example was Morton's authorship of resolutions condemning Governor Cumming for calling the legislature into session at Omaha. The resolutions adopted at a convention of South Platte delegates in Nebraska City charged, quote, acting Governor Cumming is neither an upright, honest, nor honorable man, that he is an unprincipled knave, and that he seeks rather to control than consult the people." End quote. The con convention went on to uh, call on President Pierce to replace Cumming, but to no avail. Not to be outdone, the Nebraska Palladium opined, quote, all the political renegades from every state are by brotherly affection collected around the governor and are by his aid foisted upon the people as Nebraska men, and are constituted lawmakers in Nebraska, while small-brained men of large pretensions are put into the House of Representatives for the same reasons and in the same way." End quote. The Palladium was on the mark regarding the origins of many Nebraska officials and lawmakers. Several of them had never established residence in the territory and probably did not intend to do so until they determined what advantages they could gain. Many, quote, were mere sojourners, driftwood, tempor temporarily stranded on this farther shore of the westward stream of population, but destined soon to be caught by its constant onward flow and carried off to the boundless country beyond, end quote. The territorial legislature was a fractious body, everyone looking out for his own interests or those of his town or section, little influenced by the needs or opinions of the broader constituency, which in fact was hard to gauge. According to a Nebraska historian, quote, the first legislature worked under abnormal conditions and without the restrictions of organized society. There could be no appeal to public sentiment through public discussion the present criterion and referee of public measures, because there was as yet no public." End quote. A local journalist left a description of the second territorial legislature. Quote, it is a decidedly rich treat to visit the General Assembly of Nebraska. You see a motley group inside of a railing in a small room, crowded to overflowing. 
some behind their little schoolboy desks, some seated on the top of desks, some with their feet perched on top of their neighbor's chair or desk, some whittling. Honorable Mr. A gives Mr. B a severe lecturing because he didn't vote as he agreed to. Mr. B says Mr. A lies, is no better than he should be, and reckons he ain't much afraid of him. Mr. C comes to the rescue and speaks in concert pitch half an hour and says nothing. Then a thirsty member moves adjournment, and in a few minutes the drinking saloons are well patronized. Although both bodies have about seven days more to sit, only four bills have been passed. End quote. Like several of the legislators and the governors, the territorial delegates to Congress were often non-residents as well. The first to be elected, Napoleon Giddings, was a Missourian who came to Nebraska only two weeks before the election and was described as having brought no other property with him except a carpet bag. Bird B. Chapman, the second delegate, was a, a resident of Elyria, Ohio, and never established Nebraska res residency at all. In the early years, the delegate elections played out based on whether the candidates were aligned with the north of the Platte or south of the Platte sections. Election irregularities were epidemic. Three of the first four delegate elections in the territory were contested and ultimately decided by the U.S. House of Representatives. As an early Nebraska historian put it, quote, a legally formal election on the Nebraska frontier in the 1850s was about as rare and impracticable as a social function with Parisian manners in the same region, end quote. The constant battling over who was entitled to the delegate seat meant that Nebraska Territory rarely had a sitting delegate in Congress to look out for her interests. Cummings served as the acting governor until the president appointed his successor, Mark W. Izzard, who, quote, was not endowed with shining talents, according to a newspaper in his home state. Izzard was a political hack who presided over the territory during a period when rampant speculation in real estate, propped up by paper money issued by unregulated wildcat banks, promised a rosy future, but ended in financial collapse. Izzard's messages to the legislature were bombastic and optimistic effusions, little connected to the reality of life in the new territory. In his first, he spoke of prosperous inhabitants, quote, happy in a degree heretofore unexampled in the history of the settlement and organization of former territories, beautiful and fertile prairies fast being converted into productive fields, giving good promise of a rich reward to the toiling husbandman, end quote. Now Morton, who sometimes referred to the chief executive as Governor Lizard, could not uh, <laughs> resist a response. Quote, and he's referring to the, the speech the governor gave, this document is characterized by that superabundance of sagacity, superfluity of patriotism, and superlative degree of candor which has ever distinguished from the vulgar herd the chivalric and classic sons of Arkansas. Through its sentences, one can hear the tread of a mighty intellect as it strides majestically through the labyrinthine ramifications of politics and marches along the corridors of thought, and as he hears his soul's tongue whisper in awe, the governor approaches." End quote. Notwithstanding this skewering by Morton's pen, Governor Izzard was even more optimistic in his 1857 message delivered after the six wildcat banks chartered by the 1856 legislature and approved by the governor had been, for nearly a year, pumping out thousands of unsecured banknotes that fueled the platting and sale of thousands of lots in scores of new cities that the legislature had incorporated admittedly on paper, to fill the vacant Nebraska landscape. Governor Izzard credited Nebraska with 15,000 people and spoke, quote, of our broad and beautiful prairies being thickly dotted with comfortable farmhouses and well-cultivated fields, yielding their rich treasures to the hand of peaceful industry. The appreciation of property has far exceeded the expectations of the most sanguine. 
Business lots upon streets where the wild grass still flourishes are readily commanding from $500 to $5,000 each, end quote. A Nebraska historian noted of this speech, this year's fulmination excelled the other in grandiose verbosity, end quote. Martin parodied the governor's praise of the speculative frenzy as follows, quote, no citizen of Nebraska can cast his optical luminaries over the plains and prairies of our beautiful territory without the involuntary exclamation, lots is riz, escaping from his lungs with the force and sprightliness of a gopher from his hole or a buck from the thicket, end quote. In fact, despite the governor's praise of prairies dotted with farmhouses and well-cultivated fields, agriculture had been largely neglected. Another troublesome issue was the construction of a permanent capital building in Omaha. The federal government had appropriated the then enormous sum of $50,000 and the city of Omaha had contributed a similar amount. Although Governor Izzard reported in 1857 that all funds had been spent, the building remained unfinished and not ready for occupancy. An additional $50,000 would be required from Congress to make the capital, quote, an ornament to the territory and an object of just pride to her people. Martin again responding in his parody of the governor's address said, quote, the capital building during the past year has progressed upward at an average speed of one inch per day and at a cost of $87.15 per inch, end quote. Almost ignored, by both governor and legislature were the territorial treasurer's and auditor's reports, which revealed that virtually no tax revenues had flowed into the territorial coffers. Although the federal government paid territorial officers and legislators salaries and other major expenses, taxes were required to fund local government, schools, and public improvements. But in an economy based on speculation in unimproved real estate without any underlying productivity, few taxes could be collected. A major problem was the slow development of agriculture, which eventually promised to produce a surplus to reduce Nebraska's reliance on imported foodstuffs and merchandise. But as Morton later noted, quote, the greater portion of the summer of 1856 was consumed in talking and meditating upon the prospective value of city property. Young Chicago's in Crescent, New York's, precocious Philadelphia's and infant London's were duly staked out lithographed, divided into shares, and puffed with becoming unction and complacence. The mere mention of using such valuable lands for the purpose of agriculture was considered an evidence of verdancy wholly unpardonable and entirely sufficient to convict a person of old fogeyism in the first degree." End quote. The day of reckoning was soon to come when the failure of Eastern financial institutions precipitated the nationwide financial panic of 1857. Nebraska Territory's banking system collapsed, along with the speculative bubble in real estate. After the collapse, an inventory of the assets of one of the so-called Wildcat Banks, the Bank of Tecama, found, quote, a little shanty, 10 by 12, and its furniture consists of an old table and a stove. The whole institution was attached on last Saturday to secure $207." End quote. It turned out that the bank's indebtedness totaled nearly $100,000, which is all, of course, in the hands of a people that have placed implicit confidence in the bank. End quote. The winter of 1857-58 was severe, and Nebraskans were mired in the depths of depression and poverty. Morton estimated that on January 1st, 1858, there was not on average $2.50 in cash for every resident of the territory. Finally, the people realized, in Morton's words, quote, that the new way of making money by chartering wildcat banks had proved a most unprofitable delusion and an unmitigated humbug. We thought that building large cities without any inhabitants, therefore, was a singularly crack-brained species of enterprise. And furthermore, that everybody could not live in town who lived in the territory unless the towns were laid off in 80-acre or quarter-section lots." End quote. 
With this financial disaster, however, came the realization that Nebraska's economic future lay in agriculture. The fumbling Mark Izzard resigned to return to Arkansas in the fall of 1857. At this juncture, Nebraska got a new governor, one who was truly qualified by experience to be the chief executive. He was William A. Richardson of Illinois, a former congressman who had helped lead passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in the House. Richardson did not suffer fools gladly. Immediately upon his arrival in Nebraska, he refused to recognize the actions of a portion of the legislature that had seceded from Omaha and held an unauthorized session at Florence during another of the almost endless debates over the capital relocation issue. Richardson called a special session to make up for the lack of action during the regular session. He was aided in his administration by the new territorial secretary, J. Sterling Morton, who had won the appointment when his rival, Thomas B. Cumming, died in August 1858. The special session, the fifth legislature, and actually the first that did not, did not consider a bill to re relocate the capital, actually enacted some needed legislation. Nevertheless, the lack of decorum continued on occasion, once entrapping Governor Richardson in the legislative hijinks. Quote, At one time, the House, while waiting for the arrival of the Speaker to change from a session of the Committee of the Whole back to the regular session, took a lunch, of which, a not unusual incident in those times, the liquids bore an undue ratio to the solids. And in the naturally succeeding confusion, the chairman, Benjamin P. Rankin, announced that he would rec recognize anyone on the floor who was sober. Whereupon Dean, with much difficulty and unsteadiness of attitude and speech, at once arose and claimed the right to recognition according to the chairman's conditions. Then Jim Stewart began shouting, Who has the floor? Who has the floor? And the chairman retorted hotly and a general melee followed. Secretary Morton, who was a bystander, always ready for a lark, rushed back to the governor's office and told him that the house had adjourned and was in a devil of a row. Richardson, who himself had partaken of enough of the lunch to temporarily unsettle his accustomed cautious dignity, rushed into the aisle of the legislative chamber and in stentorian tones thundered, Peace! Peace! God damn you! Peace! Then seeing that Mr. Bennett, the speaker, had taken the chair and was presiding over the house in good order, Richardson, who was a stickler for parliamentary propriety and for the observation of the distinct prerogatives of the several departments of the government, bowed most apologetically." End quote. Although Richardson proved to be the most effective Nebraska governor to date, his term was brief. He resigned in opposition to the pro-slavery policies of the National Democratic Administration, another sign of the fracturing of that party into administration and Stephen A. Douglas wings. One final sectional crisis played out in the history of the Nebraska Territory. It came to a head in 1859 when mass meetings south of the Platte led to calls for that region's annexation to Kansas. The latter territory was seemingly nearing statehood, and to the frustrated Nebraska South Platters, they saw annexation as a way to end once and for all the vexations they had suffered at the hands of Omaha and its adherents. Nebraska delegates to the Kansas Constitutional Convention made their case for annexation, which was rebuffed by a large majority. Although Nebraska's sectional animosities were downplayed in the aftermath of formal party organization and true partisan contests in the later territorial years, the issue was not dead, and capital relocation was, as you know, finally consummated when Nebraska achieved statehood in 1867. Although I've only scratched the surface, I hope this brief introduction may have whetted your appetite to learn more about the history of Nebraska between 1857, 1854 rather, and 1867. The territorial system was a unique feature of American democracy. The people of each new territory were given a basic framework within which they enjoyed considerable latitude in working out the details of self-government. In Nebraska, the road was often rocky filled with obstacles such as personal ambition, fierce sectional and political rivalries, financial indiscretions, 
a primitive economy, an itinerant population, and an often unforgiving environment. In the end, Nebraska's founding fathers, for women were then excluded from politics, as young and inexperienced as many of them were, in 13 years managed to prepare Nebraska to take her place as an equal partner in the Federal Union. In conclusion, I would just like to remind those of you who don't know that, or mention to those of you that don't know that if you'd like to read more about various aspects of the history of Nebraska Territory, I happen to have authored a little article that appeared in the Winter Nebraska History issue which is entitled Nebraska History on Nebraska Territory, A Reader's Guide. And this essay tries to summarize what I believe are some of the better articles on Nebraska Territory that have appeared over the last oh, 40 or 50 years in Nebraska History Magazine. So it's, uh, it's a way to get access to some of the articles in areas that you might be interested in. The other thing you might like to do if you haven't done so is to visit the headquarters building up at 15th and R to, to view the exhibit called Sowing Seeds for Statehood, Nebraska Territory, 1854 to 1867, which has some of the same documents and uh, early photographs and, and uh, other interesting objects that relate to this period, some of which have never been on exhibit. And uh, the exhibit is in the rotunda at the headquarters building, so you can view it uh, every day that the building is open from eight to five, I believe. With that, uh, I would uh, conclude and be glad to try to answer any questions you might have. Is that um, the building in Omaha, is that still standing? No, it isn't. And in fact, the place where this building, and there was actually an earlier first territorial capital building, but the place where this building stood is now the site of Omaha Central High School. And, and the, build, the high school building is, of course, there on that hill. So it's called Capitol Hill. There's a state historical marker up there. So if you go by Omaha Central High School, you'll see where this Capitol building stood. I got the impression it was kind of like on a hill. Yeah. And there are early photographs of Omaha, which I didn't happen to have in here, that really show the Capitol on the outskirts of town, up on this hill looking, looking down on primitive Omaha. And, and so Ezra, he died young too, didn't he? Well, he went back to Arkansas, and I think he did, in fact, die young, although I don't have much, much further information on him. There is a county in, uh, in Arkansas named after the family, and I'm not sure it's pronounced Izzard or Ezard or what, but uh, I was in Arkansas about a month ago uh, looking around at some Nebraska-related sites uh, in the Civil War period, and there is a county in, in uh, Arkansas named for this same family. I, I doubt, doubt it's the actual man that was governor of Nebraska. Jim, didn't we used to have a county name? I think we did briefly during the territorial period. It was very common for early counties, which fluctuated both in location and size, to, to be named after some of these guys. And those, those names have disappeared from our political landscape currently. But I think Cynthia's right. There was at one time an Izzard County, Nebraska. Probably good that we don't have it anymore. It's a little, <laughs> a little cumbersome to pronounce. And would you want to live in Izzard County, Nebraska? <laughs> Anything else? Lynn? I think that from your anecdote about the um, liquid refreshments that the legislature enjoyed over the noon hour, that there must not have been any territorial laws prohibiting public drunkenness. And I wonder if you could talk with us for just a minute about what kinds of laws were in fact in effect. You suggest that there wasn't a tax base local government, so were there sheriffs, were there police, was it well, anything goes? Pretty much anything went, and of course it was up to the, actually up to the first territorial governor to do something to get some kind of basic infrastructure in place, and that ended up being coming because Bert died so soon, but what I think the first legislature did was more or less adopt the, uh, the Civil and Criminal Code of Iowa with the understanding that they would modify it, but they needed something in place. I don't know specifically about uh, a law on liquor. My, my guess would be if they had any, it was probably to encourage it rather than to prohibit it. Um, there were, of course, local officials, and it wasn't that there were no laws or no 
requirements for taxation is just nobody had any money plus when in the primitive state of communications the local officials uh, often I guess didn't even know they were supposed to collect taxes for this or that so there were laws on the books that required certain kinds of property taxes and other taxes it's just that they were so difficult to collect when the population was so sparse flung all over the the place and it just was a very uh, a fluid situation. I suspect that some of those people that might have been in a place one day were, were in some other territory or gone back home to the states as they said another. So it just was hard. The census was obviously even suspect. They, they counted uh, 2,000 and some people when they took the first census in 1854. That's probably moderately accurate on that given day but uh, a week later there might have been half that many or twice that many and who knew. So. They were learning how to do this and there were no laws obviously, as, and I didn't make it explicit, but you can tell from, from the discussion, there were no laws requiring you to be a resident of this territory for any period of time before you ran for office or served in any public, public body. So uh, quite a different world. on Capitol Hill. Um, this was after the passing of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Iowa residents mm -hmm. came over toasting this newfound territory and that that picnic was then broken up by the Omaha Indians. Is, that, well, is there truth to I that? I don't recall that. that? Uh, I, know the, I know there was a gathering and I think the only part of it that I've actually heard, I've never really looked into it in detail, was that they did have at least a 4th of July celebration there and, and uh, it is true that well, I should, I should retreat from that and say that the Omaha actually had been summoned to Washington, Washington before the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed to extinguish title to much of their Nebraska land. So I can't tell you for sure one way or the other. I guess my, my supposition is it might not have been quite that, uh, that dramatic. Yes, ma'am. Things start settling down and becoming more orderly. Well, I think about the time that Richardson was governor. Uh, uh, after this financial panic had sort of gotten over with, Morton, uh, Morton, I talks about how it took a great shock to make people in Nebraska realize that there was no quick, get rich quick going to happen, and they had to be farmers and they had to till the soil and work hard. And then Governor Richardson, who was even though a short-lived governor was a practical man and he guided some, some legislation through, uh, I think they did start revising the criminal codes and some of those things. So I suppose certainly by the time other things came into play like uh, overland freighting out of Nebraska City that became a, a stimulus to the economy, by the late 18, 1850s and early 1860s you started having more stability both politically and economically. Of course, the Civil War then came along, which sort of disrupted everything again to some extent. But war also brings economic growth most of the time, so I think uh, certainly some Nebraskans profited from, from the war. Um, it took a while, but uh, they eventually uh, worked it out, so, so they had enough stability at least by the mid 1860s they thought they were ready to become a state, or we, we did, we Nebraskans. And by then, there were probably more people that could say they'd at least been here for a few months, if not a few years, whereas in 1854, the only people that had lived here very long were, were Indians and a few fur traders. Anything else? And how did, how did Bert, uh, coming from North Carolina? South Carolina. South Carolina. How did he get here? Or what, yeah, I mean, why was he? Well, he was a... How was, was he he was chosen under the political spoil system. He was, uh, had, had done something for President Pierce or he'd worked uh, in some capacity in the Pierce administration and since these were all political appointees, the president, like presidents today do, uh, they have certain political offices they can pass around and I, I guess Burt must have wanted to, to be governor of Nebraska or, or thought he could make some money at it. So the president appointed him but it took him so long to get out here. It was such a hard trip out here, no railroads. Maybe, a, maybe some little railroad he could have ridden part of the way from, from South Carolina, but then it was mostly steamboat, wagon trips. He was sick when, I got to, when he got to St. Louis, I believe, or yeah, I think St. Louis. He took, took a little time off there. It just broke him down so bad to get up here. When he got here, he, he went right to bed and never got up. <laughs>
Well, it just seems like, you know, that, I mean, I'd be outraged if a person who never lived in the territory goes to the But see, in those days, right off the bat, you had nobody, had, nobody except maybe a few fur traders, no white people that had ever lived here. So that is one of the complaints you see in this political rhetoric uh, in the newspapers is one, one paper supporting one side is, blame, is calling for the dismissal of like Governor Cumming or other, other officials because they're, they have no Nebraska interests. They're only here for their own self-interest. Well, the papers on the other side of the plat would say the same thing about the other group of politicians. And I think they all were kind of here because they saw something to be gained from it. And uh, it took a while before people started feeling true ownership of, of, of Nebraska. And to be a Nebraskan meant something besides just the political or economic benefit they could gain. I think that would be true probably of, of all new territories or many of them, although probably not not as men, not all of them were, were sort of one day vast, unsettled Indian territory, as they called it. The next day it's open to settlement. And of course, uh, when you have a territory as large as Nebraska was, I don't think anybody even had any pretensions of, of governing anybody that lived beyond you know, 10 miles from the Missouri River, and there weren't many that did. So there was no way that there was any administrative authority over the part of Nebraska territory that was today's Montana. Again, there were no really no white folks up there except a few fur traders, so they probably didn't even know it had become a territory. So. Did Richardson stay in Nebraska then after he resigned? He didn't. He went back to, uh, to Illinois, I believe, and actually, I'm trying to remember if he ran for Congress again. A lot of these guys didn't. There were there are a few. I mean, obviously, Jay Sterling Morton is one of these. He's now considered one of Nebraska's sort of founding fathers. He stayed in Nebraska. There were quite a few that did, but a lot of them, the uh, minute they either lost their appointment or um, decided they weren't going to make their fortune here, they left. Uh, about the only, the largest group of these early territorial officials that stayed in Nebraska were the ones who died here during the period they were officials, so they didn't have any way to get home. <laughs> Bert, though, he, uh, Francis Bert didn't stay here. He made, a, he made a round trip, uh, one, one trip on the way out here when he was still alive, and the second going back to South Carolina in a coffin full of alcohol, I suppose. And he's buried in, we know where his grave is. One of my, uh, my colleagues, uh, who used to be a colleague here, went down there quite a few years ago and took a picture of his, his uh, marker in this little uh, cemetery at Pendleton, South Carolina. And I don't know that they have anything there that tells that he once was governor of Nebraska for two days. The other interesting little sidelight, and then I'll quit because I never like to last till, till one o'clock. He wasn't the first choice to be the first governor of Nebraska. The first governor of Nebraska who didn't take the job or the first person asked to take the job was a, a military officer from Kentucky or a former military officer named William Orlando Butler. He turned down the President Pierce's request for him to be governor of Nebraska. But somehow the word had gotten out or, or because he was a war hero or something in the, I suppose, Mexican War. We do have a county named after him. Butler County is named after this Butler, although many people who aren't from Butler County probably think it's named after the first state governor, David Butler. But that county was named long before David Butler came on the scene. So it's actually named for this non-governor who never came to Nebraska. <laughs> uh, anything? Yes, ma'am. Lynn. One, one little point, too, that I think is, is interesting is um, the reason that for the purposes of our political organization, the fact that American Indian people lived here in significant numbers was not relevant was that at this time, and clear up until 1924, American Indians were residents of sovereign nations, but were not citizens of the United States. So therefore, they had no legal standing to participate in the government in any, in any um, way whatsoever. No, not at all. And, and in some ways, we're really treated as we, we treat what we call aliens today, that is people who were not citizens of the country. Well, and, and Lynn is exactly right that up to a point, I, I don't know what it was, late 1870s or about then, did, did the the U.S. government stopped treating native tribes as foreign governments, and they, they abandoned the treaty system at that point. But up to that period, 
they at least gave lip service to the fact that they were negotiating with, with sovereign nations. That's why they called them treaties. So most of the, the Indians that lived here, except of course the Omahas and the Pawnees and some of them on the, the eastern edge of the territory, most of the, the western tribes, it probably took them a while to even figure out that there'd been any, any change. I mean, they'd already seen the army and stuff. They'd already seen the immigrants going across the trail, so it wasn't like they had never been touched by, by the white hordes. But as far as the political change, I'm sure that if they understood what it meant, a uh, few of them heard, had heard about it. So. Well, they, as I say, they, 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 they continued to negotiate on that basis until I think sometime in the 1880s, and then they, the Congress stopped concluding treaties, so they, they stopped considering them quite in the same sovereign way as they had before, and the government more or less said, from now on we're going to dictate rather than negotiate. So I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, but I think that's the way it was. You know, Lynn? You just had a session and we talked about stuff, but I don't know if that ever came up at well, Fort Rob. Well, tribal sovereignty continues to be a significant legal issue, and the tribes today are still sovereign entities. There was some Supreme Court decision that, that tortured, produced some sort of tortured language that, that made it sound like they were a little bit sovereign, but still subject to the control of the federal government, and I, I don't remember what the exact term internal dependent nations or something like that. So that's a whole other subject that we could spend many, many hours on. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll get it. We'll get it. Were there any settlements like north of Omaha, Florence, that came up on the Missouri River at the time Nebraska became a territory in 1854? other than the government forts? Well, yeah, that's about it. Fort Randall was up there, and then it wasn't too long. Niobrara, the area around Niobrara settled up a little bit. There was a little settlement there very early. Um, but no, I think beyond, beyond the, uh, the federal forts, you mentioned Fort Randall, and, and of course there were forts on up the river. Fort Union was a fur trading post up in today's Montana that was going at the time, but uh, those little towns all came along pretty much right after 1854. And some of them obviously ex still exist, to came. Did they, did they have representatives in the territorial legislature? Well, they probably did, although most of the, I mean, the governor apportioned these, these districts, as I mentioned earlier, kind of to suit himself and to favor the North Platte. So, I don't think each little town per se was entitled to a re representative, but they probably worked it out so that the logic was that the re representative would come from the, the, the areas, uh, largely the most settlement, and that would be these little villages. And uh, most of those towns that really took off were, of course, steamboat towns on the river. Inland, there wasn't much going on away from the river for quite some time. Well, we took one more question after you applauded, so you don't have to applaud again. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs>